He's young. He's energetic. He's talking about skills and support more than incarceration. And he actually has some experience with the juvenile justice system himself. So David is here to tell us about his own personal experience, his journey getting to this job, and what he hopes to accomplish with it. Welcome to Education Today. Thanks for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to take this job and what it is you hope to achieve with it? Absolutely. I'm still trying to make sure um, this is this is happening. <laughs> like many people were surprised in the community, I was just as surprised, uh, but very happily surprised. I, you know, I'm born and raised in Oakland, California, the city that I know and love, and the city where I certainly got into a a bit of trouble, but was able to get some help and and turn things around before things got too serious. And with the help of uh, some mentors, as well as the renowned Omega Boys Club in San Francisco, which then had an Oakland chapter, uh, we went to college at Howard University in Washington, D.C., and actually came back here on vacation thinking I was going to back to D.C. to pursue a career in journalism. And worked with uh, a wonderful woman, Sandy Close, and uh, with the Pacific News Service. And we had then started something called The Beat Within, which is a writing program in Juvenile Hall. Then was just in San Francisco, and I was able to bring the program actually to Alameda County's Juvenile Hall. Wow, now 16, 17, 18 years ago, um, and worked every week in Juvenile Hall. Actually, up until the time I went to Washington, D.C. in 2005. And so... It's a it's a it's a long story, but eventually uh, started working with the mentoring center, a, a very um, incredible organization in Oakland, working with young people coming out of the state juvenile justice system. And while I was there, I eventually became the executive director of that organization, and we were able to have pretty uh, incredible growth. And I was asked to come to Washington D.C. Uh, to be a part of the juvenile justice system, something I never imagined that uh, I would do. And I was asked to be the chief of committed services, which meant I ran juvenile parole and ran our one, ran our one juvenile institution. And I went from there to New York. And then I got a call from some folks here saying, would I be interested in being the chief probation officer in Alameda County? And I was once on probation in Alameda County. And so obviously the thought of that was both frightening, but also uh, refreshing that I would even be considered. And, and to the credit of the board of supervisors was not only selected, but selected in a way where I told them I was not interested in this position if it was business as usual and I talked to them looked all of them in the eye and said I wanted to make significant change and they said that's what they wanted and not only had selected me but since then have really uh, supported and backed me so I'm uh, excited and uh, also excited about the uh, amazing support that I've received out there. So you mentioned a lot of things I'd like to follow up on, and I'll kind of follow up on them one at a time. Uh, the mentoring center is real interesting to me, your own experience on probation, and then the fact that the Board of Supervisors here is progressive enough to want you, even though you're telling them you're going to do it on your own terms. So let me take those things one at a time. Did, did anything about your own experience on probation influence how you want to lead the department? No question. Uh, you know, my experience on probation is interesting. It's It's not I don't think the traditional experience, my experience meaning at that time was good, right? Mm-hmm. Um, my perception of the probation department when I was kind of a wild-eyed advocate <laughs> was that the probation department hadn't been so good. Uh, and so it was basically I had very little interaction with my probation officer, which for me was good. There's a lot of studies that show that low-risk youth their engagement with the probation department only makes them worse. Mm, that the best thing that you can do for lower risk youth is nothing, mm. right? As far as the probation department is concerned. Mm. Now, there's a bunch of intervention and prevention programs that would be great working with this population, but generally when the probation department, which means if you don't re- respond to my calls, if you don't check in with me, I'm going to lock you up, mm. right? And often that only makes young people worse who are at the lower and even medium risk uh, level, which I think for the most part I was. I was engaged every now and then in some pretty challenging behavior, mm. uh, but uh, for the most part I wasn't deeply entrenched into a criminal lifestyle um, where I needed some more severe intervention. I needed some help. I needed some support, which actually I was able to get. Now, I didn't get that from the probation department, so that's part of the things that I want to change is that we helped. I got it because of an old girlfriend, a high school teacher, things that I happen to have a connection with. Uh, and so that's 
that does give me the perspective of what I want to do is probation officers making sure they're engaging young people and referring them to supports, services, opportunities to help them turn their lives around or just get the extra push that they need. So what are those support opportunities? What things need to exist that don't exist? I mean, I have a background as a high school teacher. Now I teach teachers. I worked for the city for a while. I do think I don't think anywhere near enough money is spent, um, but of the money that is spent, it doesn't all feel to me like it connects with young people in the ways that it should. So do you have some perfect ideas of what the programs uh, should be? Yeah, I wish I had the silver bullet, but uh, I will I will mention some things. And ultimately, what I think young people need the most is a healthy relationship with a positive adult. And. That may come in the form of a program that may be your counselor, that may be your case manager, that may be your mentor. But what ultimately makes these programs successful is that healthy relationship with a positive adult. Now, that being the case, I think there's basically five, the big five, as I call them, needed services that young people in trouble uh, need the most family services, family engagement, whether that be counseling, support, whatever that looks like, but that support for the family. Uh, secondly, educational help, whether it be tutoring, whether it be advocacy to get in the right program or the right school. Third, employment services, helping the older young people getting ready for uh, the trades or whether it, whether ready for employment, whether that be going to college or to a trade school or to whatever it may be. Uh, then some of the more specialized services services around drug treatment and mental health. And so those are the big five mainly that's mainly needed for young people that we see in the juvenile justice system. But again, all of that, whether within one of those services or separately, it is that positive, healthy relationship with a positive adult. So if if it were possible to create healthy relationships for every kid with adults, um, I, I wonder, though, if if there's not systemic uh, issues and and how you manage to get around them or or plan to um, there aren't jobs right. so um, you know every young person and their family needs financial resources but neither the parents nor the kids have a chance to bring in much money into the family I mean do those kind of things challenge you in what how, how do you relate to that challenge or do you not feel it's that big a one <laughs> no it's an enormous challenge i mean because we spend a lot of time trying to get young people ready for jobs prepared for jobs and whether it be training and job uh, coaching and all of this work to enter to a job market that's incredibly difficult for someone with a master's degree who've never been arrested to get a job, right? So it's it's obviously difficult. One thing I've attempted to explain, which is a, which is a little difficult and some may possibly even say controversial, is as far as the system is concerned, it's actually more important for us to help somebody who's at risk of committing criminal activity get a job than just your quote-unquote average Joe. Mm -hmm. And that could be difficult for someone to take. What do you mean? If I've got a master's degree, I've never been in trouble, shouldn't I deserve support more than somebody? <laughs> and, and, the, and, and that's an interesting argument. But the issue is, as far as the, for me, running the criminal justice system, my main goal is that people don't recommit crime, right? The way I want to do that is by giving the skills, supports that they need. And so one of the things that I think we should do as a county, as the city of Oakland and other cities in the county, as the state, uh, is make special provisions for this population. So, for instance, the county enters into numerous contracts every year. For instance, construction contracts. The county is about to build a new tower at Highland Hospital. Let's say that all of the contractors, 15 percent of all the people that they hire, must be county clients, whether that be people on probation, whether that be people on general assistance to the social services agency that the county uh, con the vendors must hire county clients. And I think we have those built in mechanisms. Same thing for the city of Oakland. Same thing for the state of California. I think we can make uh, we can internally create a structure that we are having job opportunities for the people that we're serving. So um, that's beautiful. There's a, a whole or new organization called Oakland Works, which is working on a similar type of approach to those jobs that are going to be available at the Army base. Absolutely. Uh, behind the presumption that there's a lot of economic activity in urban centers like Oakland, but 
mostly the residents don't get much benefit. They neither get employed nor do they get the contracts to do the work. So Oakland Works is kind of a coalition around that, and I think they'd probably like to talk to you about your end on and, the Alameda and County, too. My thought around this is very specifically around Oakland Army Base, to be honest, right? Uh-huh, okay. <laughs> so I'm very much thinking about that project. It's a long-term project. We have a lot of opportunity. I think there is uh, some great examples. I was before, right before coming to Oakland, I was in New York. There's an organization called the Center for Employment Opportunities where they take people coming out of prison, provide training opportunities for them, and then put them in kind of six-month transitional jobs. And if you finish the training, you automatically get one of these jobs for mm-hmm. six months. And then the employer has time to see, is this a good employee? And that if we provide some incentive and even some supplemental wages, then at the end of that six-month period, the employer would be much more uh, apt to hire that person having seen that they have done a good job. That sounds like a wonderful uh, approach. One of the questions I always had about, uh, you know, some cities have done this call-in thing where they call in people who are on, and and but it never seems to me like it's immediate enough. I mean, telling somebody we're going to lock you up if you don't get a job isn't any good unless you have a job to send them to the next morning. Absolutely. Okay, you got a new chance. Here it is. It starts tomorrow. We got child care, dental care, and go to work. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, I, I, that's uh, beautiful. Um, I know you're also somewhat involved in realignment in the state. Do you want to talk about that at all, what what it means for you and your agency? Sure. Uh, so criminal justice realignment does three things, did three things starting October 1st, that on the adult uh, uh, criminal justice side of the house, um, that people in state prison today they're for a nonviolent, non serious, non sex offense. When they get out of state prison, instead of being on parole, which is a state entity, they'll be on under the supervision of the probation department, the county entity. The second thing is newly convicted nonviolent, non serious, non sex offenses. When people are convicted of those, they can never go to state prison. They only can go to county jail and get out under the supervision of the probation department. And then third, parolees, state parolees, when they violate the terms of their parole and are re- revoked, they only can go to county jail, not state prison. And so for Alameda the county. We have 848 people that when they get out of state prison, they'll be under the supervision of the probation department. Unlike some of the media stories, they're not all, they didn't all get out October 1st, right? Some of the media was calling saying, where are the buses going? Can we right. get pictures I of the buses? Uh, um, and so it's their regular release date. Instead of being under parole supervision, they're under the supervision of the probation department. Most people don't even know the difference between parole and probation. So yes. not a gigantic change, though, in all honesty, it is it is very significant. Uh, Alameda County has a history, quite honestly, of doing this pretty good, of keeping lower level offenders locally. Um, and so we think that Unfortunately, the bar is very low of doing better than the state. The state has between a 70, 75 percent recidivism rate. I'm pretty certain we can do better than that. Uh, but we also need the resources. The state uh, really um, uh, put Alameda County as a disadvantage because they gave us a significantly lower part of the pie as far as money as uh, in regards to the other parts of the state. So the state for the first fiscal year allocated three hundred and sixty million dollars. Alameda County only got two point six percent of that, even though we're home to the, you know, we're the county home to the city with the highest crime rate in the state, and we have a huge number of people involved in the criminal justice system, but because to make it simple, we've done a pretty good job already of keeping them locally. They've basically penalized us for doing the spirit of the law already. Wow, where do we go to campaign about that? And now, that is a, really unfair. That's another big campaign. You know, the, the, the quick example that I've been given to to exemplify this is San Bernardino County and Alameda County get about have about the exact same crime rate. San Bernardino County sends about three times as many people to state prison than Alameda mm. County. And so because of that, for realignment, San Bernardino County County got in the first year $25 million, and Alameda got $9 million, wow. even though we have the same crime rate, meaning we have the same amount of people we have to deal with. We just have done a better job of keeping them local. Frustratingly, ironically, is that's the spirit of the very law. Right? Yes. So we got penalized for doing it too too early, yes. I guess. Yes. Uh, but that is, that is uh, although there is an organization, the, 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 the state organization of county governments, um, who kind of came up with the funding formula, ultimately the state legislature and the governor, uh, the state legislature voted and passed and the governor signed this funding formula into law. And so we are heavily lobbying to change the funding formula. 
you hope that will be successful? We hope that, it, you know, there, there's, there's folk, folklore about these funding formulas never changing, even though it was only one year, right? So they have to come up with another one or they just pass the same one. And, you know, we've been trying to scream about this from the mountaintop. And similarly, San Francisco and Contra Costa are somewhat similarly suited, that yeah. the, the Bay Area urban counties have done a pretty good job of not sending all of these lower level offenders to state prison. And so we've done a better job of keeping them local uh, and therefore got penalized by the funding formula, which really does not make sense. And so there's other formulas that can be used, like crime rates, right? If if they distributed the money based on crime rates, that would be a fairer way to distribute the pot. Are there any organizations that are campaigning in the kind of directions you think that are, you know, we have an activist listenership here in Hmm. KPFA, so if there are things people could do to be helpful, and I don't know if you have any offhand, but... Yeah, there, there's a there's a couple of things. And even to this issue of realignment, it frustrates me that I spend a lot of time talking about the funding formula because the policy is correct, mm-hmm. right? Lower level offenders shouldn't be sent to state prison. Uh, they should be kept low. I think criminal justice is best administered locally. Uh, and so I want, I would rather be supporting the governor and supporting realignment because I completely agree with the policies. They just messed up on the funding formula, uh, which is significant, right? Because we need those resources in order to continue to do a good job uh, and in Alameda County. Uh, but I think that there's a, there's a number of things on juvenile justice front. You know, we're trying to change the way we administer juvenile justice. Uh, we want to support young people in the community. We want to provide services, supports, and opportunities. We don't want to just first incarcerate. Incarceration should be held simply for the young people who are a true risk to the public safety. There's a lot of young people locked up in America who don't meet that criteria. It's just for bureaucratic expediency. They're locked up. And so we want to turn the tables and say we're only going to incarcerate those young people who are truly a risk to the public safety. And even when we do that, we want to provide them rehabilitation opportunities. And so there's a lot of support around the advocates that I would need uh, around that because uh, both on the adult and the juvenile system, as soon as somebody goes and there's some egregious crime that's committed and somebody makes the assumption it's because of my policies that this person was out, right? Although ultimately the department that I run, the judges determine who's in and who's out. Um, that's, you know, in, individual incidents, un- <clears throat> unfortunately, are going to happen. But what I'm asking people is after a few years, I'm able to turn the organization around. I've only been here six months, so I still need a lot of time to really make some I fundamental so. changes. Six <laughs> but uh, that's when the support, you know, I'm asking people look at the overall department, look at our statistics, look at our track record. Uh, and that's what I want to be judged on, not the individual incidents, not the Willie Horton effect. Right. Uh, um, that is unfortunately going to happen. Right. So um, do you... Since since a big part of this, so this is an education directed program mm-hmm. in general. It's called Education Today, <laughs> and uh, so we're very interested in the youth end of I- issues. And I wonder if you're doing anything with school systems, the it, proposing anything you think school systems could do to um, make the juvenile aspect of this better and more humane, and you know all the goals that you have. Absolutely. What the, the overarching goal or overarching approach that I'm ch- taking to reform or change my department is one of positive youth development. Right. The 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 focus we want to have on young people is a strengths based approach that we want to build on their strengths and assets, not focus on their deficits. And I think. The schools obviously have to do that as well. Mm -hmm. There is a growing partnership between the Oakland Unified School District and Tony Smith, the health care department in the county with Alex Briscoe, the social services department in the county with Lori Jones and myself at probation that we have and in the Oakland Department of Human Services with Andrew Youngdahl and Sarah Bedford that we have a united focus. And through the California Endowment, actually, we've come together to meet once a month to say we're going to focus on a common goal. And we all decided to support Tony Smith's goal of every youth will graduate. It's a simple but really revolutionary goal that every young person will graduate from Oakland Unified School District, and we all have a part to play with that. So what I want to do is I want to place probation officers in schools not to be police, not to be extra security, but to help young people stay in school, to help young people where, when, they, when they have issues that they're dealing with. Most young people in the system are there because of the trauma that they have experienced in their lives, that they've experienced some extreme pain, and because of that pain and trauma, they have engaged in delinquent behavior. Instead of just looking at the delinquent behavior, we want to address the trauma that they've experienced, and we need partnership with the 
with the public schools in order to address that trauma because the number one thing young people should be doing is being in school. Right, so we want to support that number one issue, which is around education. One of the one of the programs that we're going to do, to, for an example, is we have 202 people today in Juvenile Hall in Alameda County. What I want to do is I'm trying to recruit hundreds of volunteers to come into the Juvenile Hall every day for one hour to either help young people with their homework or read with them. So we're calling it the reading and the homework hour for five days a week. One hour a day, we're trying to literally, my ultimate goal was if there's 202 people in the hall today, we want 202 volunteers to come in. So there's a one-on-one for every single young person. And if all that happens is an adult from the community comes and reads with a young person for an hour a week, great. But if that relationship can continue, even when that young person comes home and on to the school, because also through Tony Smith and through the programs he has, he has people coming into the schools doing reading, that we can create a lasting relationship, getting at that point of a healthy relationship with a positive adult. And so that's going to be significant partnership with the school district. So, uh, and if, if somebody were interested in volunteering, how would they... Uh they, they can contact my office at the Alameda County office, uh, Alameda County Probation Department. We have a website. We have a Facebook page. We have a Twitter <laughs> account. We're trying to uh, stay, keep in contact. Uh, I dare to say this, but I'll get you to the right person. You can email me at dmohammed at acgov.org. Now, that's really, that, that takes a lot to put that out on the uh, air. And I've also talked to his assistant. They're actually not that hard to get a hold of, and she's right. really nice. That's a, so, uh, she's great. so I that's think they're fact. trying to uh, have a, a really uh, open to the public we want you around type approach so if people want to be part of those 202 volunteers uh that that's a way to do it um i'm wondering um just uh time for a couple more quick questions there's a lot of um other countries have a really different approach um i've been interested uh met some people from sweden for example where they call all the, everybody that's incarcerated a client and and they're they're not in pr- prisoners their clients and they're uh, treating them as though they have some kind of the, the types of traumatic experiences that you're talking about which they assume are there and responsible for why people are locked up so i i wonder if there's any conversation around uh the justice system in the united states which frankly seems pretty backward to me overall about looking at how some other advanced developed countries do things differently <laughs> absolutely I mean, we we have a lot to learn in criminal justice in america obviously we we have the highest incarceration rate of any industrialized country in the world by far right and and very ineffective at doing it and i think that america's finally getting the picture unfortunately it's not for the reason I would like, meaning they understand this is not the right thing to do. It's ultimately been about money, mm-hmm. right? And so when I saw the cover of Parade Magazine, right, not the most progressive <laughs> publication, right. but, you know, kind of a, the definition of mainstream America, if you will, and on the cover, an article written by a senator from Virginia saying America locks up too many people, mm-hmm. right? And uh, that I think people get the picture that it's far too costly, and far too ineffective, mm-hmm. right? So it's about one of the most expensive things that we do, and it's so ineffective because people just go in and out, in and out, that I think finally we've got folks from both sides of the aisle and all across the political spectrum saying we have to do something different. Now, what that different thing is, I don't think we have massive agreement on, but I think that people finally recognize something has to be different. And I think the proof is in prevention, intervention, evidence-based practices where we begin to treat people as human beings and we begin to treat or address the underlying factors that contributed to the behavior, not simply quote unquote punish the behavior i uh have a couple of mentees of my own who are high school students very much interested in the issue of the death penalty and they wanted me to ask you uh if you had any thoughts about that or in that in relation to other kind of inhumane practices that we have in the u.s well i think like unfortunately the criminal justice system uh as a big part of the criminal justice system the the death penalty is broken uh, this death penalty sentence uh process is broken. I mean, I think that what we saw in Georgia recently uh, with the putting to death um, of a man who I think something like 10 of the 12 witnesses who had uh, in his original trial recanted, there was no DNA evidence whatsoever. Um, I think that that's concerning more 
just as concerning, if not more, is in Illinois, where they took a significant look at who was on death row, and so many people were exonerated because of the DNA evidence. Mm. Uh, I think that I would say regardless of what you think of the death penalty, because of the process itself is broken, we need to step back and take a significant and sincere look at, okay, this is kind of the ultimate penalty. And if we could alternatively say life in prison without the possibility of parole, which ironically is less expensive um, than putting people to death, I think we need to do that and examine what are we doing, right? And again, I think even people who are the the huge proponents of the death penalty have to say, okay, let's look at the process. There's obviously some significant flaws if we have in Troy Davis and we have in all of these uh, men in Illinois who have been exonerated because of DNA evidence that the process itself is significantly flawed and we need to re-examine it. Wow. So it's less expensive to keep somebody alive. I, that that figure I hadn't even heard. Although I agree with you that the financial thing is driving a lot of conservatives to be uh, m- more concerned about incarceration rates. And, you know, I guess this is the way a profits making system works, right? I mean, as long as it looks like it's going to be profitable, that's great. As soon as that turns around and something else happens, I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, I thought Michelle Alexander, who wrote the incredible book, you know, uh, The New Jim Crow, she wrote an article in the New York Times uh, basically saying, yes, there's this movement of kind of reform and criminal justice. Unfortunately, it's about finance. It's not about humanity. And I agree with her. Um, I just said, you know, to be honest, I'm in this work. I'll take I'll ride the horse that's going to get the. Give us the change that right. we're going to need. And do you find uh, other counties, other cities where you feel optimistic about the work that we're doing, that they're doing, that people, our listeners might want to check out besides your own work? Yeah, I think that there is. There's there's places around the country that, that are doing some things I think we need to look at. As far as juvenile facilities are concerned, the state of Missouri has some extraordinary juvenile facilities. As far as juvenile justice in the community, Wayne County, where Detroit is, is doing some extraordinary work. I actually had the fortune of uh, recommending to Mayor Kwan in Oakland while she was there to take a look at it, and she did. Did and she was very uh, impressed, and we're talking about how we can use things from that system. I think, uh, you know, in California, San Francisco on there is doing some things I think are innovative. Uh, there's some other places, Napa, for instance, and, uh, you know, you may never think that you would get uh, <laughs> from Napa County, but they have what they call a response grid, is that when people on probation engage in positive or negative behavior, that there's clear responses from the department of what they're going to do, that it's more transparent. And so there are, there little things here and there around the country and 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 my thing is i don't want to reinvent the wheel right, right. if there's great ideas out there i i, I love stealing great ideas <laughs> and so i want to look across the country and the world to see what's happening good and we want to replicate it we've been interviewing david mohammed who has recently appointed the chief of probation in alameda county and has some really innovative ideas about what we should be doing We really appreciate him being here with us today. Uh, I'm Kitty Kelly Epstein, and uh, this is Education Today, which airs the first and fourth Fridays of the month. The producers for Education Today are Kevin Cartwright and Jaron Epstein. Thank you to Michael Yoshida for engineering our program today, and we hope to talk with you again soon. Thank you, David, so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Come, Harry Belafonte is coming to Berkeley. 
From a childhood of poverty in Jamaica and Harlem, Belafonte grew into one of the world's most popular singers, a film star, and a lifelong devoted activist in the civil rights movement and many other humanitarian struggles. Now 84, Belafonte will present his autobiography, My Song, in a KPFA benefit on Wednesday, November 30th, 7.30 p.m., First Congregational Church, 2345 Channing, in Berkeley. There's wheelchair access. Advanced tickets are $15 at brownpapertickets.com or at our independent bookstores. For more information about this much-needed exhilaration, go to kpfa.org. That's November 30th. Bella Fonte.